on this very joyous and special day of celebration. Illustrious Norman Mordu, 33rd degree, our keynote presenter and his wife, Christine. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Sublime Prince James Johnson, 32nd degree, President and CEO of the Robert H. Jackson Center, and thank you for your hospitality and making many of the arrangements. Mr. Greg Peterson, founder of the Jackson Center and currently board member. Illustrious P. Michael Nielsen, one of my teammates, 33rd degree, an active member of Supreme Council also. Distinguished brother James Stoll, 32nd degree MSA, Commander-in-Chief. Illustrious William Winchester, 33rd degree, Secretary of the Valley of Jamestown. Our illustrious honorary members of Supreme Council, distinguished recipients of the Meritorious Service Award, and the staff of the Jackson Center. Carol and Deb, thank you very much. Brethren, ladies and guests, illustrious Nielsen and I bring you special greetings from the deputy for the state of New York, the illustrious Peter J. Samet, 33rd degree, active member of Supreme Council. How joyous it is that we should gather today in honor of a special tradition of caring and that special tribute is being paid today to the illustrious Stanley Weeks in the venue of the illustrious Robert H. Jackson Center is very, very special in concert with the Scottish Rite virtue of service to our country and mankind. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Greg Peterson who will continue the program. Thank you. Welcome. Law Day 2013. Stanley Weeks Law Day 2013. No need to recite that which is in the program regarding Stanley Weeks. It is an incredible outline of an incredible man who had an incredible career. He also had much to do with where we are today. In fact, Bill Winchester is sitting in a seat which has a plaque, it says Stanley A. Weeks on it. And it's a seat which was where Stan Weeks sat, I think it was 1951, there was the Robert H. Jackson class. And just as Robert Jackson came back here for that class in the 32nd degrees, which as I understand was the largest class ever. And in fact, in, after we got started at the Jackson Center, there was a picture that appeared in the paper which had those members, surviving members, from that class who were, uh, had paused and reflected on that class more than 50 years ago. In fact, you'll remember some of the names, Thomas Nethery, Milton Howard, Jim Kelly, Carlton Winchester, Charles Dorman, Stanley Weeks, Harold Aldrich, Lee Sperry, and John Sedin were all part of that photograph. Stanley Weeks was very much responsible for why we are here honoring a 33rd degree Mason in the fourth year at the Robert H. Jackson Center. A little backdrop which you may not know. In January of 2000, I had the privilege of sitting down with Stan and interviewing him about his life and times as an attorney in Jamestown, New York. About his life and times as a young law student an American who had a chance to catch up with his dad's neighbor in the law practice in Washington. And there they had a chance to go to the Department of Justice. And he actually had time, Jackson spent time with young Stanley Weeks. We had time to talk about the life and times of Stan Weeks as he went through and coming back to Jamestown after having met and married Sarita Weeks 
and his opportunity to participate and be involved in masonry. We also had a chance to, to, for him to identify his relationship not only with Jackson, but his relationship with this community, this relationship with many, many of the individuals and many of the organizations of which we've come to know and revere. I'm sure everybody who's here today has fond, fond recollections of Stanley Weeks. And since it's now up, let me show you a brief vignette of an interview we did, we being John Barrett, who was the biographer of Robert Jackson and myself, uh, with Stan. It went for two and a half hours. It was wonderful, but you'll get, won't have to watch all of it. This is that which deals with his uh, views on masonry. Masonry. Oh, I was uh, about 30, okay. something like that. First, the Masons, mm -hmm. uh, which is the oldest organization in Jamestown, really, organized in 1817. That was just eight years after Pernigast put his sawmill on the, the rapids, which is the Shadokoin River. They've been going ever since and still quite strong. And of course, Jackson was, was a member of that, right. yeah. as well as Greg here and his father. Okay. Uh, and were you, are you a Mason? Yes. Okay. How, how does one come to be a Mason? Is it through your father or your uncle being a Mason? No, it doesn't. Uh, that isn't a qualification. It's just uh, if they want to be associated with the Masons, they uh, ask a member of the organization for an application to, to join. Okay. And uh, then, of course, it has to go through an investigating committee to see whether they're mm -hmm. proper persons, reputable and moral, and they have to have a strong belief in God. And the three degrees, which is basic masonry, which is very good. It's uh, according to some of the ancient uh, constitutions and the ancient rituals. King Frederick the Great added uh, certain degrees on, in the Scottish Rite. Uh, he was very interested in in the Scottish Rite Freemasonry in Germany and in France. What we call the Blue Lodge is the first three degrees. That's masonry. Uh, the first three degrees, if you have those, you're a definite full-fledged mason. Then it can branch off into what they call the York Rite, uh, which was is predominantly English masonry. And then there was a the Scottish Rite, which uh, is a rite which really originated in France. Uh, they called it the Scottish Rite because a number of Scottish Masons lived in France. And like um, most of the nobility in France were mm -hmm. members and Voltaire and mm -hmm. uh, very prominent figures. And that spread over into the uh, United States. And Bob Jackson was a member of the Blue Lodge in Jamestown, and then he became both a York Rite Mason and a Scottish Rite Mason. Eventually he was uh, what they call coronated a 33rd degree Mason. 
in, in Philadelphia, I think. The, I think he had to, Is that where he got his? I think that's that's right. where I got mine in Philadelphia. Oh. We've got this in the uh, yeah. Mason Archives from the Book of Marks. Could you explain yeah. that? I, I I saw that. Yeah. In the Book of Marks, and this this is uh, York Rite masonry, uh, and this is the see Bob Jackson. And when you when you go into York Rite masonry, there's the Mark Master and different parts of that, and you're supposed to, you know, in ancient times. Uh, when the stonemasons would would hew a stone, fitting it for the building, right. they would make it their mark on it. Right. You've sure. probably seen them; they're right. different marks on right. their stones, like Harry Truman. Of course, he was a 33rd degree mason too. When he was had the restoration of the White House, uh, there were a number of stones in the original building of the White House that had the Masonic marks on them. And he saw to it that one stone with a mark on it would be sent to each of the Grand Lodges in the country, which is amazing. Yeah. But anyway, when you become uh, a Mark Master Mason, you have to devise a Masonic mark, which you, if you were a stone mason, would uh, engrave on the stones to identify the stone that that was your right. your masterpiece. But this is what Bob Jackson did. He he devised a, a horse head because he was so interested in horses. Right. And here's his. He had a beautiful signature. He certainly did. And uh, description horse head. That was in 1930. Right. That on his birthday actually, February 13th was his birthday. So this is his, uh, his 38th birthday. Is that right? On yeah. his birthday? On his birthday. Mm hmm Well, then... Uh, I didn't know he had uh, artistic ability. That's a nice little sketch. Yes. Uh, pretty hard to chisel into a stone. <laughs> yes. Uh, but this, it's, it's remarkable that you got this, uh, Greg. Uh, I remember going through the Book of Marks and I came across Bob's. Uh, well, you mentioned it when we interviewed you a couple of years ago. I now, see. What, what do these letters stand for? I'm not sure where to begin. But. Well, it's uh, Hiram Tyre, widow's son, sent to King Solomon. It's hard to be separated from her because she was always a, a wonderful helpmate somebody that uh, you could always rely on for almost any occasion. It's, it's difficult that she has passed on. We had always assumed that I would be the one that would be going first. And uh, I know that she would not have aggrandized so many of the things that that, that uh, I have tried to do since she passed on. But uh, that is as it is. Stan Weeks. It is, it's, it's personal. And where we are today is a real personal testament to Stan Weeks. Again, when I did the interview in 2000, January 2000, this was well before there was a Robert Jackson Center or even a Robert idea of such. And when we concluded, he said, Greg, if you're ever going to do anything with this concept of Robert Jackson, consider as a facility the Scottish Rite Consistory. And then he went on to explain something which subsequently Lee Sperry did a very nice job uh, of Justice and Brother Robert Jackson, 
He explained that on October 22, 1929, Jackson was raised in Mount Moriah Lodge No. 145. He became an active in Masonic circles and joined the Western Sun Chapter No. 67 Royal Arch Masons on October 22, 1931. He received his Scottish Rite degrees in Jamestown Consistory in November of 1930, and you saw some of that right there. He joined the Jamestown Commandery, number 61, Knights Templar, on December 18, 1931. And he'd been nominated by his home consistory for an honorary 33rd degree when, Grand, when Sovereign Grand Commander Melvin Johnson, 33rd degree, decided and did on September 27, 1950, create him a Sovereign Grand Inspector General, 33rd degree. He was an exemplar of his class of the Jamestown Consistory, named its largest class of 100, 118 candidates in his honor at its May 1951 reunion, and Donald Levengood pinned him his 33rd degree jewel uh, at that time. And these were pieces of history which I certainly did, wasn't aware of, even as a Mason, uh, about Justice Jackson, his relationship here, and ultimately it was Stan who encouraged to purchase this facility in sort of Robert Jackson's memory because he was a 33rd degree Mason. It was uh, Stan Weeks together with Sarita who came here often. It was Sarita Weeks who wrote the history on the Jackson Center which we have today. That's why I included that little piece on the relationship between Stan and Sarita. It was magical and it was real. And it was Stan Weeks together with Judge Cass who was intimately involved in many of the early activities of here. You'll see the Stan Weeks room, which was created, which was the old gold room for the many of those who remember, and it's there where the picture was taken with Chief Justice Rehnquist and Sarita. From a poignant perspective, that last piece which you saw on Sarita, I just got a comment, there's probably no segue to it, but I had interviewed Sarita, I had interviewed Stan, and I thought kind of that was all put to bed, and Sarita had talk quite a bit about the love affair, the relationship with Stan. Stan saw it, I actually put it on TV, and it was uh, quite wonderful. Stan called me and said, Greg, you gotta come down and interview me. I go, I didn't want to say this, but we've done this for three and a half hours, what more could there be? And the sole thing was he wanted to enhance and set the record straight, if you will, uh, and to, for me to film for posterity the relationship between Stan and Sarita really quite a love story, a really quite poignant for me, and there's, it's, a long, it's a wonderful long piece of which you just got a part of it. I'm honored here to talk a little bit about Stan Weeks. I know I probably exceeded my time, but bear with me. Uh, he was a magical individual, a person who had a tremendous impact on this community. It is extremely important, and I believe uh, exemplary, that Law Day here in Jamestown would have the name Stanley Weeks. He was a man for the ages who believed in community, brotherhood, and the need to preserve legacies of our past so it would inspire future generations. I conclude by just simply saluting the memory of Stanley Weeks and honored that we could have today Time for reflection on him as part of the named Law Day, Stanley Weeks, Law Day 2013. Thank you. Mr. Scottish Wright, uh, uh, we thought about several items, ideas of what would be most fitting for Stan. And uh, we do have this uh, Bible. Uh, illustrious uh, Brother P. Michael Nielsen showed up at my office and he says, boy, he says, I got this heavy thing about 40 pounds out in the car. <laughs> and before this Bible showed up, I looked extremely long and hard on the website and there was really nothing out there that really fit this occasion because the ones that are available now are about $153 and they look very cheap for this special occasion. So I'm honored and I'm blessed that Mike brought this to us from the uh, consistory up in Buffalo. He found it up there and it was not in use, so we brought it down here. We decided we would use this for this special occasion. 
the Bible will be on display in the week's room. And uh, uh, at this time, <clears throat> uh, I would like to present the Bible uh, to the Jackson Center. And I uh, would like to turn it over now to uh, uh, Jim Johnson. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, on behalf of the Jackson Center, it is indeed our pleasure to accept this Bible. And as Bill has indicated, this Bible will be on permanent display in the Stanley and Sarita Weeks room. And again, we're just very, very honored to have it, to have it there. Also in the, in the room is furniture that came from Stanley and Sarita Weeks. And so that is truly a room devoted to them. And if you haven't been, been in it yet this evening, please, please go by as you leave the building. Um, before we continue, I believe that we do have one more presentation. And so I'd like to invite John Siggins to come up for just a moment, please. Thank you, Jim. And uh, back in uh, 1998, I believe it was, when uh, Stanley Weeks had just completed his term as the inaugural master of the Justice Robert H. Jackson Lodge of Research here in Chautauqua County. And uh, as I became the new master of the Justice Jackson Lodge of Research, Stanley presented me this gavel and gave it strictly in charge that it would be determined where it should find its final resting place. And this gavel is the traveling gavel that Stanley Weeks carried with his personal baggage and luggage all over the South Pacific while he was serving this nation as a commander in the United States Navy and in tribute to Ray Worshipful Brother Weeks's distinguished Masonic career, I can think of no better place than this personal traveling gavel which was prepared for him by the ship's carpenter, turned out of cola wood, and he carried it with his personal belongings all over the South Pacific as they went from island to island. Each island, they set up a Masonic club. They didn't have a Masonic lodge, but Stan wielded this gavel all over the South Pacific, and it's with great pleasure that it finds a resting place along with this Bible in the Stan and Sarita Weeks room of the Robert H. Jackson Center. accept this Bible or to accept this gavel and again it will also be on permanent display. Uh, before I turn the program back over to Steve Whitaker for our featured guest tonight, Greg I noticed you didn't you left out one story <laughs> and so maybe I'll try to tell it. If I don't get it right I'm sure you'll 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 set me straight. But you may have noticed this cane leaning against the Bible. And if you recall in the interviews that Greg showed the last interview was Stan, which took place in the Weeks Room here at the Jackson Center. I was long before my time, but uh, Stan came into the interview with that cane, as I recall, you telling me the story, Greg. And when Stan left the interview, he left that cane, forgot to take it with him, <laughs> leaning in the corner, against the corner by the fireplace in the Weeks Room. And that cane has probably not left that room <laughs> since that day until this afternoon when we carried the cane up here to be with the Bible. And of course we will return it to its spot in that room and it will also be there on permanent display. Thank you very much. Norman A. Du, 33rd degree. The Chief Judge of the U.S. District Court in the Northern District of New York and I were both members of a class that had been coronated on September 26th calendar year 2000 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I recall that the 12 of us met with our ladies some months ahead of time 
to provide a little bio and a little explanation. And um, Norm and I were the only Vietnam veterans seated at the table. And I heard his story of heroism in Vietnam and uh, I was greatly humbled. He is also the recipient of the first Robert H. Jackson Award to be presented by the New York Council of Deliberation for community service in recognition of distinguished service to mankind, and that was in calendar 2005. His early participation as an athlete of distinction, his very, very distinguished service as a Vietnam veteran, his contribution to our society through his legal achievements, to election to the federal bench in 1998, and his recognition and celebration as an honorary member of our Supreme Council are very unique. We take great pride in introducing the illustrious Norman A. Mordu, 33rd, for his remarks at this special session. Good evening. Good evening. Illustrious brothers, Brothers, friends of masonry, uh, <clears throat> this has been a unique experience for me to, uh, to come here to the um, Jackson Museum tonight and give a talk about him when I didn't know an awful lot about him until I got asked to do this. I'd heard about him. I knew that the chief uh, clerk of the United States Supreme Court who's a friend of mine, we, we get talking about who's your favorite judge and, or justice. He, he, he mentioned uh, Justice Jackson was his favorite. Then uh, two years ago, the, the chief judge was going to come here next week. He said, there had been some ceremony over there. And the next morning, although I was in Syracuse, he, he said, please come, because I was chief judge, he said, please come and have breakfast with me at 8, eight o'clock in Buffalo. So I got up a little early and I went there and met him, and lo and behold, he's talking about Justice Jackson, one of his favorite justices ever of the Supreme Court. So it's uh, <clears throat> it's kind of funny how I started learning more about him, and I did receive the award in 2005 in, in honor of his name. So I guess, Steve, that's why you, you asked me to come here. I wasn't exactly sure what I was supposed to do tonight, I did a ton of research. I could talk literally for hours. I'm going to not do that. I've cut it down as much as, as I think I could to have it make some sense. But here are my thoughts based on the research I've done. Robert H. Jackson, born in 1892 in Spring Creek, Creek, Pennsylvania, over in Warren County, not far from here. At the age of five, they, the same they moved to Frewsburg, and he grew up there. and he. Um, lived there with his parents, went to high school there. Then he PG one year and, and came to um, Jamestown for high school. And he, so then his career in the federal pu public service as an attorney, prosecutor, and Supreme Court justice spans a tur turbulent time in American history. From the Great Depression through the Second World War and into the Cold War and the arms race of the 50s. A passionate constitutional scholar, an eloquent, eloquent speaker and writer, Justice Jackson is best known, however, as Chief United States Prosecutor of the highest level Nazi leaders at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg, Germany. In preparing for this talk, I read many of his excellent speeches, articles, and judicial opinions. What has impressed me the most is his deep reverence for our Constitution. Justice Jackson believed that our Constitution is our best protection against all threats to our democracy. Throughout his career, he turned to the Constitution for guidance in addressing the dangers of economic depression, totalitarianism, and war. Justice Jackson recognized that no one, no matter how wise, could devise a Constitution which coming generations can apply to their problems mechanically as they can a multiplication table. The framers wisely, quote, left the future to fill in much of the detail according to its own experience, its judgment, and its own patriotic purposes. 
Therefore, the Constitution is flexible enough to respond to each new challenge we face. Justice Jackson quoted President Woodrow Wilson as saying that the Constitution is not a mere lawyer's document. It is a vehicle of life, and its spirit is always the spirit of the age. Justice Jackson's vision for America was that we, we would continue to preserve the basic principles of the Constitution and adapt them to meet the changing needs of our nation. He believed that if we did this, we could meet every challenge without losing our freedoms. Now, I'm sure many of you know that Justice Jackson, of his background, I'm just going to talk about it briefly. He attended high school in Frewsburg and Jamestown. He did not attend college. In 1910, at the age of 18, he began working as an apprentice in a two-year law firm in Jamestown, New York. He then attended Albany Law School, completing his two-year program in one year. However, the law school denied him a law degree because he was under the age of 21 at the time. He did pass the New York Bar Examination in 1913. During the next 20 years, Justice Jackson joined a law practice in Jamestown. He married. He built a very successful private law practice, primarily in Jamestown. A Democrat, he was involved in state, uh, New York state politics, but preferred the practice of law as to opposed to electoral politics. His attitude toward being an advocate was, Never quit until all avenues have been explored. If he lost a case, it was, only, it was not before he tried every motion possible that he could come up with, argued as hard as he could for his client. And in the end, if every avenue was done, the appeals were done, you lost the case, he then said, quote, you join the client at the tavern and you damn the judge which is the last right in closing an unsuccessful case, and he said, I have officiated at none. Uh, beginning in 1934, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt appointed Justice Jackson to a series of federal positions culminating in Justice Jackson's appointment to the United States Supreme Court in 1941. That is a meteoric rise from 1934 to 41 to be on the Supreme Court, coming from a town of Jamestown. The years between 34 and 41 were dominated by the Great Depression, the New Deal, and the rising threat of war. Justin, Justice Jackson's experiences during these years shaped his vision for America. In his, his first federal appointment as general counsel to the Bureau of Internal Revenue, Beginning in 1934, Justice Jackson prosecuted Andrew Mellon, one of America's most wealthy men, for income tax fraud. Justice Jackson supported tax reforms to promote great greater equity in taxation. In 1937, now as head of the Justice Division, Justice Jackson prosecuted the antitrust case against the Aluminum Company of America or Alcoa, Alcoa, Alcoa. Ultimately, Alcoa was placed under court supervision for 20 years until 1957. Justice Jackson stated, American, American people will not permanently tolerate monopoly. In 1938, he was promoted to Solicitor General, the lawyer responsible for arguing the government's position before the Supreme Court. In this role as a legal advocate, which he greatly enjoyed, Justice Jackson successfully defended several New Deal laws before the Supreme Court, including laws dealing with bankruptcy, taxes, and farm programs. Justice Jackson became a passionate supporter of the New Deal. He deplored the hardships of the Great Depression and believed the government could assist in creating a more equitable balance between rich and poor and corporations and laborers. He supported labor laws, retirement laws, prog progressive taxation, laws that favored small businesses, and the suppression of monopolies. He believed that our Constitution provided a source of power 
to advance the general, the, the general welfare. So in 1935 and 36, however, the Supreme Court struck down some of the most important New Deal laws, including a minimum wage law in the state of New York, a labor protection law in the coal mining industry, and the Railroad Retirement Act. Justice Jackson bitterly criticized the decisions as tending to make a sweatshop out of the whole nation. Justice Jackson viewed the Supreme Court decisions striking down the New Deal laws as reflecting unreasoning devotion to precedent. He warned that the resultant failure to respond to the suffering caused by the Great Depression threatened our democracy. He stated, when free government becomes too perplexing and futile, the people turn to dictatorship. It is the simplest form of government. Out of the breakdown of an attempt at free government, which failed to function, arose Hitler, Lenin, and Stalin. In 1937, after President Roosevelt's landslide re-election and his threat to reorganize the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court reversed itself, overruling its prior minimum wage decision, approving collective bargaining laws, and upholding the Social Security Act which Justice Jackson strongly supported. Justice Jackson hailed these decisions as mark, marking a legal revolution as real and meaningful as any ever fought on the field of battle. Justice Jackson later noted that the Nazis promised German workers that once they won the war, they would receive reasonable old age pensions, generous health programs, a single free time vacation program, just wages, and training in a profession. Justice Jackson stated with pride, there's not one, one item in this Nazi promise to the German workers that this country has not already begun for American workers. Some of these measures need, need extension and improvement, but the point is that the processes of democracy are bringing them here to American workers sooner than the marching armies can bring them to the German workers. President Roosevelt encouraged Justice Jackson to run for governor of New York, telling him he would be in an excellent position for the presidency in 1940. Justice Jackson responded that he did not think, quote, his capabilities ran in the direction of political office and that he preferred to stick to the law. He considered returning to private law practice here in Jamestown. In 1940, President Roosevelt appointed Justice Jackson as the United States Attorney General, head of the Justice Department. Justice Jackson said the appointment dropped him into a sea of trouble. The position was highly political and placed him in the middle of disagreements between Congress and the President. He wasn't comfortable with that sort of a role. He believed that all democracy is on trial. Although not yet in war, America was building destroyers for Great Britain and shipping military supplies to Europe. America's need to protect itself from espionage and sabotage presented Justice Jackson with complex issues involving wiretaps, border control, and overseeing resident aliens. Sounds like today, doesn't it? <laughs> Think about it. The worm turns, it comes back. But Justice Jackson warned that our individual freedoms should not be sacrificed in the interest of national defense. He stated, in the process of upholding democratic ideals, we must not unwittingly destroy or impair what we are endeavoring to preserve. A year later, in 1941, President Roosevelt appointed Justice Jackson as an associate justice of the United States Supreme Court, except for a year and a half as chief prosecutor in the highest level Nazi war criminals in of the highest highest level Nazi war criminals in 1945 and 6, Justice Jackson served on the Supreme Court until his death at age 62 in 1954. Justice Jackson's two most widely known decisions during his first years on the Supreme Court reflect his concern that compromise in our constitutional principles in response to the war posed a greater threat to our democracy 
than the war itself. The first decision was West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett. It involved two young girls, sisters, Jehovah's Witnesses, who were threatened with expulsion from school for refusing to salute America's flag on re religious grounds. This case came before the Supreme Court in 1943, a time of intense patriotic emotion. The Supreme Court, in a decision by Jackson, upheld an injunction against the school district based on the girls' rights to free speech under the First Amendment. In his decision, Justice Jackson wrote that the states could properly require schools to teach American history and government, and that such teaching tends to inspire patriotism and love of country. Here, however, he stated, we're dealing with a compulsion of students to declare promote national unity by persuasion and example, but they may not coerce acceptance of a patriotic creed. Justice Jackson wrote that the ultimate futility of attempts to compel national unity is the lesson of every such effort from the Roman drive to stamp out Christianity as a disturber of its pagan unity, the Inquisition as a means to religious and dynastic unity, the Siberian exiles as a means to Russian unity down to the fast failing efforts of our present totalitarian enemies, the Axis powers. Those who begin coercive elimination of dissent soon find themselves exterminating dissenters. Compulsory unification of opinion achieves only the unanimity of the graveyard. The following year, 1944, the Supreme Court decided Korematsu versus the United States. This case arose from a military order authorized by the President and Congress to exclude people of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast War area in 1942. They were required to depart the area, report to an assembly center, and to go to a relocation center under military control to remain for an indefinite time until released by military authorities. Now the plaintiff, Fred Korematsu, that's his nickname, Fred, he had another name, is very much a, a Japanese name, but he was called Fred. I learned tonight, he thought Justice Jackson was his attorney, or not for Greg. But the plaintiff, Fred Korematsu, was convicted of remaining in an area from which people of Japanese ancestry were excluded. It was undisputed that Korematsu, who was born in the United States, of parents born in Japan, was a loyal United States citizen. The Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the internment order as within the war powers of Congress and the President, justified by pressing public necessity to prevent espionage and sabotage. Justice Jackson wrote a strong dissent, stating, quote, oh, a citizen's presence in the locality, however, was made a crime only if his parents were of Japanese birth. Justice Jackson warned that the court for all time has validated the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure and of transplanting American citizens. He stated, much is said of the danger to liberty from the order in turning it citizens of Japanese extraction, but a judicial construction of the due process clause that will sustain this order is, far more, is a far more subtle blow to liberty than the promulgation of the order itself because of the dangerous precedent it creates. As an aside, you historians of war, the 442nd Combat Infantry Regiment was made up of Americans of Japanese ancestries was, one of the, was the most decorated regiment in, in the World War II. It had 4,000 Japanese soldiers. It turned over uh, three and a half times, 14,000 uh, 14, up serving. It was known as the Purple Heart Regiment. It actually had 21 uh, uh, Medal of Honor winners uh, come from that. It was the most highly decorated regiment in, in World War II. And I think Senator Dan Inouye, uh, we just passed away, I believe he lost an arm uh, serving with them. And they fought in Italy and France against Hitler's army 
and earned a, a reputation of an outstanding infantry unit. Now, in 1945, President Harry Truman appointed Justice Jackson to serve as the United States Chief Prosecutor to the highest level Nazi war criminals. Justice Jackson took a leave of absence from the Supreme Court to do so. Within a year and a half, the four allied nations created the first international court and procedure known as the International Military Tribunal. It indicted the 22 surviving highest level Nazi leaders and tried their cases through verdict and sentence. The defendants included Hermann Goring, commander of the Luftwaffe and original head of the Gestapo, Rudolf Hess, Hitler's deputy Fuhrer until 1941, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, highest surviving SS leader, Albert Speer, Minister of Armaments, responsible for the use of slave laborers from the occupied territories for arms production. Also, there was Martin Bormann, successor to Rudolf Hess as the Nazi uh, party secretary, who was tried and sentenced to death in absentia. The first task for the Allies, each with a different legal system, was to create the court and procedure. Justice Jackson believed that even Nazi war criminals were entitled to our most basic constitutional protections. Reportedly, Great Britain proposed that the accused simply be executed. The Soviet Union argued that the Nazis are already known to be guilty and that the only purpose of the tribunal should be to declare their sentences. The French and Soviet systems did not give a defendant the right to testify under oath or permit him to introduce evidence on his own behalf. Justice Jackson was deeply concerned that the trial should not be used to carry out or rationalize previously settled political or military policy. He added, farcical judicial trials will destroy confidence in the judicial process. Abandonment of our principles and participation in show trials would imperil our freedoms. Through persuasion and compromise, Justice Jackson obtained for the accused the right to a fair and open trial for specified offenses, to be proved by evidence, with the right of counsel, and the full opportunity to testify and submit evidence in their defense. Only in this way could the tribunal's actions be justi justified before the future. Now, this is not the occasion for the fascinating story of the Nuremberg trials. The defendants were charged with combinations of four crimes, waging aggressive war, committing war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and conspiracy. The, the, the tribunal held that following superior orders was not an acceptable defense whatsoever. Ultimately, 12 defendants were sentenced to death, Seven were, seven were sentenced to imprisonment, and three were acquitted. That the tribunal and the accomplishments are so highly regarded to this day is due to this in substantial part to Justice Jackson's principles. The tribunal applied justice rather than violence to punish war crimes. It established waging aggressive war as a crime, established the concept of crimes against humanity, prevented the Nazi leaders from becoming martyrs and created a permanent record of Nazi atrocities. It established a model for future international war crimes courts, and it demonstrated that the principles of our Constitution could be adapted to respond to the chaos of international war, and in doing so, preserve our freedoms, and in Justice Jackson's words, enunciate standards of conduct which bring new hope to men of goodwill. Now, in 1947, President Harry Truman announced the Truman Doctrine of supporting free nations against the threat of totalitarianism, particularly communism. Justice Jackson recognized that our communist enemies were supported by fanatical partisans within our midst, but stated, probably much greater than their capacity for actual harm is their capacity to arouse fears and hatreds among us. Justice Jackson believed that our constitutional principles were our best protection against the communist threat. He warned against the weakening of our civil, weakening of our civil liberties in response to the threat, stating, 
The dangers to our liberties are those we create ourselves. And he added, it is easy by giving way to passion, intolerance, and suspicions of wartime to reduce our liberties to a shadow, often in answer to exaggerated claims of security. For example, during the Korean War, President Truman ordered the government to seize and operate steel mills to avert a strike. The president believed that the stoppage, the stoppage of steel production would jeopardize our national defense and that his powers as chief executive and commander in chief of the armed forces authorized this action. The Supreme Court, however, held that the Constitution does not give the president the power to take possession of private property in order to prevent labor disputes from stopping production. The case is Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer. Justice Jackson wrote a concurring opinion stating that the short-sighted temptation to grant extensive power to the president during war wartime holds grave dangers for the country in the long run. And during the 1950s, communist agitation, racism, and political disputes gave rise to a number of Supreme Court cases. The most well-known is the landmark decision, decision Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, the last major case in Justice Jackson's career. The Brown case held that segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race violates the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. The Brown Court unanimously overruled the notorious 1896 decision in Plessy versus Ferguson. In Plessy, the court had upheld a Louisiana statute requiring railroads to have separate but equal accommodations for black and white passengers by providing two or more passenger coaches for each passenger train or by dividing the passenger coaches by a partition so as to secure separate accommodations. The Brown decision, written by Chief Justice Rule Warren, held that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Brown was decided May the 17th of 1954. Justice Jackson worked on a draft of a concurring opinion, although he ultimately joined Chief Justice Warren's unanimous decision. In his draft, Justice Jackson stated, I am convinced that present day conditions require us to strike from our books the doctrine of separate but equal facilities. He expressed well-founded concerns regarding future enforcement of the decision, stating it is apparent that our decision does not end, end out, does not end out, does not end, but begins the struggle over segregation. And during the weeks leading up to the court's delivery of its decision, Justice Jackson was in the hospital. Reportedly, Chief Justice Earl Warren visited Jackson at the hospital numerous times during that period, as and as a result of their discussions, incorporated at least one of Justice Jackson's main points into the opinion. Justice Jackson left the hospital to attend court on the date the decision was issued. In fact, all nine Supreme Court justices were present so as to illustrate the unanimity of the decision. He died six months later. Now, Justice Jackson died in 1954, the age of 62, from a heart attack. Every justice of the Supreme Court came to Jamestown for his funeral. He's buried in Frewsburg under the headstone that reads, quote, he kept the ancient landmarks and built the new, end of quotes. In concluding my observations about this brilliant patriot, I read you the following statement that he wrote that comports with his faith in our Constitution. He stated, I toast democracy not alone for what it is, but chiefly for what it may become, not merely for what it has done, but also for what it makes possible for us and our children to do. Its road to the future leads through discussion, reasoning, persuasion, experiment, trial and error. Progressive democracy does not lead to violence, revolts, or armed coercion. It leaves our destiny with no limitations except those which our own minds impose 
and no pitfalls except those that might be dug by a failing faith. It is our heritage and our hope, and we mean to keep it. Thank you. Holy and glorious Lord God, we are thankful for this opportunity to recognize our fraternal brother, Stanley A. Weeks, who was a true gentleman dedicated to community, philanthropy, living by the principles of Freemasonry, which are friendship, morality, brotherly love, and the brotherhood of man under the Father of God. Lord, we pray that through your spirit and guidance, that we would also be able to emulate those qualities that Brother Stanley exhibited in his daily life. We are thankful for Judge Mordu being able to be here this evening and for the message that he has delivered on this special occasion. We pray for your blessing upon him and his wife. We are thankful for those individuals who contributed to the arrangements for this program and also pray your blessing upon them. Now, Lord, as we leave this program and go forward in our lives, during the spring season of rebirth, may our spirits in service to you blossom forth in the same way as the new leaves of spring flowers that we are seeing burst forth each day. We pray for safe travel for all that are present, and that you will be the lamp unto our feet, that you will illuminate our pathway and keep us under your watch care each day of our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.